And we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Global Citizens. My name is Kelvin. I am the show's host. And of course, I'm also its creator. So for this particular number, it's actually the year of my birth. So you guys can know what is my age. So I've told it several times. But in case you guys are watching it for the first time, you'll know what is my age. So my guest for today is actually somebody whom I actually know from a connection uh, who, from Singapore. So his name is Mr. Chris Larimore, originally from Blytheville, Arkansas, a small town north of Memphis, Tennessee, before living for two years in New Orleans during his college years. Uh, Chris originally wanted to be a globetrotter. However, he fell in love with the land of the rising sun, Japan, and had remained there since. For right now, I think it will be his 25th year. So after two decades working for a company called Berlitz, of which he paid his dues and rose from an English teacher, to head the various departments within the human resource area. Chris joined a startup division in Creek and River Company to create a new way of training for professionals and creatives, which focus on skill improvement to help lawyers, doctors, system engineers, and other professionals succeed in their career. So I hope I've done enough justice in this introduction. How are you, Chris? I'm doing well, thank you. It was very well done. I couldn't do it better myself. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I hope. I um, uh, if, uh, if I miss out on anything, please add on later <laughs> throughout the entire session itself. <laughs> sure. All right, Chris. Uh, yeah, so this is going to be my first question. I typically reserve it for third culture kids. However, so uh, for your case, though, I decided to do an alternate version of it. I want to ask you is, how would you define home? A lot of the people who grow up in multiculturally or maybe have spent time abroad, regard their loved ones as their home. However, do you still feel home is New Orleans or is it in Tokyo itself? Sure. Um, my hometown and my, my home country will always be America. It will always be that sense. But no, my home is, is now is Tokyo. Um, I have now lived here longer than I lived in the U.S. Um, and although I am not Japanese and have not the idea to be Japanese, uh, I am a citizen of Tokyo. Uh, and I don't mean a Japanese citizen, but I mean a, a person living inside Tokyo. And this is um, my, my. there's an expression in Japanese called uh, your niwa, your backyard. And so this is my backyard. This is where I know. And think. When I go back home, and I, I do use the word when I go back home, meaning my home country, um, I see the changes and realize that I'm out of touch uh, in many ways of the situation. Um, and I have lost track of uh, almost all of my friends uh, back home. Uh, in America, and so I, my friends, my my loved ones, everyone are here, basically, besides my immediate family back in the states. Um, so no, this is is my home. Now the the, the question, of course, is uh, how long do I plan to stay here? Hopefully, if I'm lucky, uh, I'll be able to retire on an island somewhere, maybe Hawaii or Thailand or something else like that. That will then will become my home in that regard. But that's my dream, not necessarily my plan. Uh, but to answer your question, no, Tokyo is, is my home in that regard. All right, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, for those of you who are watching this for the very first time, Global Citizens is an online live stream platform that is conducted once a week, or at least as time as permit for myself, since so this is my own stuff. So the main purpose of this is intercultural awareness, uh, studies, and advocacy for a group called Third Culture Kids, basically like myself, uh, somebody who grew up outside of his own passport country or parents' culture, and actually Chris's kids are actually well, uh, they are binationals, uh, which falls under the category of cross-cultural kids, which now also am umbrella third culture kids. So uh, the main purpose of this is for people to realize that this life as a global citizen is not an extended holiday. It's not a vacation whereby you are in, you will stay in a place that could be considered the tourist destination. Is because this is not an easy thing for a lot of people because not only do you have to adapt how you think, you have to adapt how you talk, and sometimes you question who you are because there are times whereby you are asked on identity and that's not always an easy concept to just say, hey, I'm from here, when you might not be. Because I've had people with three passports in this country, in this show, and they, if you ask them where are you from, oh, I'm from this, 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 Nobody will ask, nobody will understand, and they will be asking certain questions like, no, where are you really from based on your skin color and from your appearance? So I hope people could be more sensitive on that part, and this is what the show is all about. 
All right, Chris. So I'll come pass the platform back to you. So I actually use the term El Dorado, which is the city of gold. It's sure. actually, uh, I actually want to create some Japanese related part to it, but I can't speak Japanese. So, so sorry on that. I know it, there's some hiragana, katagana. If you want me to speak in Mandarin, I can, but okay. I think it's related to one of the traces, but okay. Uh, yeah, so El Dorado was actually termed by one of my earliest guests. His name is Alberto Antonucci, who actually spent over three decades in China, even though he's from Italy. So he he, he said that he, China became his Eldorado, his kids and even his grandkids actually grew, have grown up there or spent time there. So that's wow. something that that is something that I actually always remember. So whenever somebody actually have their kind of experience whereby they found some place outside their passport country that they fell in love with, that became El Dorado. So I kind of want to ask you is that uh, wh what makes the place that for you? And also, uh, just to make it even, have you ever experienced loneliness in that country? And how do sure. you deal with it? Sure. Well, you, you, your, your point earlier about it's not a vacation um, is very true in that a lot of people come to Japan and, and teach English because uh, it's a, a job that if you're a native English speaker, you can get quite easily. And they think that this is a vacation and they don't really, sometimes they try hard, sometimes they don't try hard, but they kind of don't take it very seriously. Um, for me, this was a test uh, when I first came here because I wanted to see if I could live outside of the U.S. Um, I had grown up in the middle of America there um, between Memphis and New Orleans and places like that. And I had not really been out, and I didn't know if I was a man of the world or not, as it were. So that's the first step. It became my Eldorado because I passed the test myself. I was able to come here and be successful. And also because it became so many opportunities. I took the situation seriously. I took my original job as a, as a teacher seriously and on and quickly was able to, to move up um, inside the company and the company gave me lots of opportunities that were basically here just because I was an English speaker. Um, the, surely there were some uh, other talents that were involved, but that was the core talent that got me in the door and then was able to get me up through uh, the ranks and things. And so that was uh, truly a city of gold because it didn't require a lot of extra special skills. It required seriousness and it required uh, some diligence, but it didn't require uh, to be an IT engineer or to be you know, a medical or, or any other kind of very seriously uh, trained person. Um, and so that was very, very, and also uh, the people I met here. Uh, I was very lucky the people that I met were very good. Surely you do have some situations that are not um, ideal, uh, but when you live in a town of, of Tokyo, 30 million people, of course, there are good and quote unquote bad people um, all over the place. And so I've had a very much more uh, good interactions and met many good people here and, and, and had a lot of experiences, a lot of the success here. But in answer to your second part of the question, yes, especially my first year here, um, because of uh, certain times, uh, there are lots of uh, national holidays here. And um, my Japanese friends uh, that I had just made would go back home to their hometowns. They would leave from Tokyo and go back. And I was sitting around Tokyo at that point and realized that I didn't know um, that many people and I didn't have uh, anyone uh, really to talk to uh, at that time. Um, so I would say probably over the first four to five years, there were times of the year that I would be um, rather lonely in that case. Um, at the same time, the, the funny thing was is that, um, of course, there have lots of movies here, lots of movies all around the world. So I would go in and go watch a movie. And there are subtitles in the movie, but if you're focusing on the movie, you forget the subtitles and you just watch the movie and it goes on. Then the lights come up and I look around and I see this entire sea of black hair. Um, and everyone there is in the back of the head and everyone looks and I realize, oh, that's right, I'm in Japan. And I would forget that um, at times. Uh, and so it was kind of uh, an interesting thing to kind of get lost in the situation. Also, too, the first year I was here, I would wake up uh, probably once a week and realize, that's right, I'm in Japan. I'm in a foreign country. I am here. Um, I've got a job. I've, you know, I've got a life. I've got a career. And I, I passed that test. So that was the, the real special part of it. Uh, but yes, you're right. Um, there are times when you get a little bit lonely. Uh, when suddenly you're not you're not part of the team anymore, and you realize that you are outside um, in that regard. Again, it wasn't anybody rude or anything being uh, mean to me. It was just simply they went home and went back to their their families uh, in that regard. So, okay. but yes, I was very lucky. That's the reason it's my Eldorado. <laughs> All right, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, yeah. So, since you've settled there for over two decades, you've pretty much ingrained your life there. Your wife is Japanese, and as I mentioned in the opening, you have two bi-national kids, right? Yes. So, 
when you throughout your whole time not only managing your family life but also your work life have you ex experienced any significant learning opportunity in my show people i don't like to use the term failure we call it always call it learning opportunity because when you are in a new place, you always need to learn how to navigate moving around or even knowing how to talk, how to respond, or maybe some ways that people reply, you might not be what it is. There's a different under layer beneath it. So how is your experience with that? Sure, I, I've been lucky. I, most of the time, I, I think I've, uh, if I have made that mistake or that failure, I, if people reply enough not to uh, let me know. But there were a couple of times where I realized, uh, and most of the time it was after the fact, that I, I completely misread that situation. One happened um, in a job interview that I had here about, oh gosh, now 20 years or so ago, where we were discussing um, the idea of communication. And I was, I'm not, even now, I'm not a, a fluent uh, Japanese speaker, but at that time, I definitely wasn't. And I said, well, okay, you don't speak Japanese, but you can understand Japanese. You can, you know, you have a, you've lived here for a while now. You have a general understanding of how people interact and things like that. And I thought that he was asking me that, how did I feel in that regard? And I answered him about the idea of tatamai and honmai, which is, it's not unique to Japan. Uh, everywhere people put on masks, um, figuratively, uh, and they don't hide, or they don't show their true feelings. But there is, it's a systematic um, expression here about how that when you are dealing with someone who's not part of your community or not part of your inner circle, then you would you put on your mask and you show the politeness and you show um, tatamai, you show a, a sort of a face to the person and you don't show them your true feelings. And so I spent the entire time explaining that and how that that was something. So I don't necessarily always understand uh, Japanese except for people that I've gotten a close connection with. Um, and he was just trying to, to get me to say, yes, I've been in Japan long enough that I understand uh, a little bit of Japan. Um, and so with that question, the other person in the interview realized, no, um, he doesn't know what he's talking about, and so I lost a job interview in that regard. You, you mentioned earlier uh, about your situation, um, and I, I don't know what happened there, but I, I realized later after the fact that uh, the one person was asking me a question to set me up and give me an, a softball, and I went through this big philosophical um, description of things that was completely off topic, and so I completely misread that situation. Um, so in that sense, he was actually showing me, oh my, he was really showing me, you know, Chris here, let me help you out, as it were, um, and I failed miserably in that regard. But. <laughs> Uh, I, yeah. learned I learned from it. Yeah, for the situation that was mentioned, I actually, I actually was approached by a recruiter, however, for Facebook job application, but I failed in my second round of interview. And the reason for that was because they know that I am much capable on the application side of it. However, for the procedural side of it, I think I I need some time to improve on that. So at least that's not on cultural differences because I am pretty, I'm pretty sure the interviewer doesn't have any issue with me since I think the first 10 minutes or so for us, when during the interview, I was talking about sports, which was supposed to be part of my job. So I have the, I have a broad knowledge of that, but the cultural part, I wasn't affected by it. And there's no way I will, even if I do fail about it, it's not easy for me to admit because I create a show for cultural differences. <laughs> but at least I didn't fail on that part. I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. So, I'm okay, sure. okay. Thank you. So, yeah, okay. That's, okay, okay. That's, yeah, that's something to work on, actually. Like, you instead, you went through deep when you, but you didn't answer the actual question, yeah? Or say yes. So basically, I, I I I've been in Japan long enough that I can know when someone is being homai and tatamai, and I do, and I can understand what's going on, and I can under read between the lines of that part, and I've gotten even better in that now over the last twenty years too, of course. So yes, the answer yes, I can. I it's not I'm not a fish out of water in that regard. Uh, I've got more knowledge and more skills uh, than someone just fresh off the boat. Uh, but I was yes, I was uh, I was got too deep in my thoughts. I got too caught up in myself and in my knowledge of Japan, actually, and, and, and blew the interview, or blew that question, for sure. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, um, I, I'm going to sidetrack a bit. Tatamai, Hanmai, and is there, isn't there a third one, right? I actually remember this, I actually remember this, this concept quite well, because I read, reread it several times. So Tatamai is the face that you show to people. Hanmai is the face that you show to people who are closer to you. And the third face is the face that nobody will see. 
is that a third one or am I? It could very well be. Uh, I, to be honest, I'm not as studied in that. I, I read an article about it and then I've, w I've witnessed it. I've, I've interacted with it and had it in that regard. So you could very well be correct. Um, there is the idea of, of what you show outside, what you show to the inner circle, and then perhaps what you don't show at all uh, would be your mahomono, I suppose, uh, which would mean the real thing. But um, I apologize. Um, you're, you're better versed in this than I am in that regard. Uh, uh, yeah, it's just a hobby, but yeah, I've, I've heard about it and I've actually applied the concept several times and I've reflected on it several times. So yeah. Huh, okay, and I, I don't think it's unique to Japan. I mean, definitely it, it's systemized here and there's a whole discussion about it, but I mean, I think every culture or every, every people, we do have times where we put on our masks, um, and we don't show our, our true feelings. I mean, that's just human nature, I think. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. No worries, no worries. All right. Uh, throughout the two decades, though, in Japan, and I'm sure you actually go back and forth, right, with, to the U.S. to visit your family sometimes. What about do once you a feel? Year. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, once a year. About once a year before COVID, yeah. Oh yeah, okay. Oh yeah, COVID is unavoidable. Uh, okay. So, what do you feel though has been the ultimate blessing to living this life as a global citizen? And just to make it fair, though, is there a downside that you have ever felt from living this? Sure. Well, for me, um, the, the the best part was and getting uh, the job here, and then being able to travel uh, throughout Asia and throughout Europe uh, on the business travels that the company was paying for. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to bring my children because they were in school, um, and my wife was taking care of the kids, so that was a, a little bit of an unfortunate, but being able to travel, and then using the, the miles and the points that you got from it, then taking the family travel uh, at other times and other places and things. Uh, but that was a, a, a very good thing, and also just to see the, the and interact with all the people. Or if I'd stayed in Arkansas, uh, I'm sure I could have had a fine life and could have lived well and done things, but would not have near the uh, adventures and met nearly the variety of people and learned as much as I had. Um, now, the downside of it, though, is that I have uh, I've lost touch with uh, then people that were very fine people back in, in Arkansas and in, in the States, um, and I've really uh, completely uh, don't contact them anymore, and it just they, they fell off the, the wayside. That, that's laziness, and that's also busyness, um, and just uh, lack of, 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 of uh, being out in front of me and, and being part of a top of mind kind of thing. And so that's a little bit of a shame uh, in that regard. And uh, people come up to me uh, will, and ask questions about American and American history. And, uh, you know, I'm an American citizen. I went to American school. I should have a little bit. And to be honest, um, these days I probably know a little bit more about Japanese literature and a little bit more about Japanese history than I do uh, American history because I've read it more recently and things. And I have lost that aspect of being able to be not an ambassador, I don't mean in that sense, but just to be a, a citizen of the world and, and represent uh, and, and giving people some some subject matter um, uh, about uh, the states uh, and things like that. I don't have as much knowledge as I used to have. I've forgotten a lot of it. But uh, no, I wouldn't I wouldn't change it for the world, though. The the benefits way far outweigh the the, um, the detriments. OK, OK. In that room. Earlier, you mentioned that in a sense, you kind of lost connection with a little bit of your connection with the US side, right? Yes. You have two binational kids, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Okay. May I ask though, how is your relationship with them and how are they perceived in the in Japan itself? Because maybe this is something that I know from the from articles, etc., in that Japan is still primarily a, a monogamous society or homogeneous society, sorry. Sure. Is that there's still a there's still a strong acceptance if only if you're pure Japanese, maybe if you are an expatriate, maybe you are, they are more welcoming to that. However, there's still like in a sense, there's a certain kind of social stigma that's negative to kids who are binational or sure. they have mixed race. I actually read this from Rui Hachimura, an NBA player who is half African-American and, oh wait, sorry, he's half African and half Japanese. So yes. how is your own kids with that? Sure. Well, one thing I can say is you know, everything you've said there is, is, is correct. Uh, uh, everything you, you've learned or studied on that is accurate, that a uh, there is the idea of, of being Japanese and then everyone else not being Japanese. Um, and that um, inside Japan, of course, there are many different types of people and many different types of philosophies and things. So it's not as if everybody thinks the same, but there is this um, this wa or this idea of being uh, Japanese. And if you're not um, 
perceived as being that, then you are everything outside. You are a guy, um, uh, the idea of being outside. And so, and you're right, me being a foreigner, and especially, you, you mentioned the, the NBA player, but you also have Osaka, uh, the tennis player. Uh, oh, who, Naomi Osaka, yep. Yes. And so in both situations, they, of course, you mentioned African American, African and Japanese together, and my children, I'm obviously white, and my children are white and Japanese, and there is a, a, a stratosphere there, too, so that First, you're, you're Japanese, and then maybe you're completely foreign, and so that you're accepted as a foreign person, not inside the, the bubble, but accepted as that. And then if you are of a mixed race or binational, then there are strata if you are white and, and Japanese as opposed to African and Japanese. Um, I think that there's a lot more. And even if you're foreign and African, uh, for that matter, there's also uh, a lot more stigma uh, that is played to that. So uh, I grew up in the South uh, in America, um, and I do, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up with, people who are racist, um, as it were, and I, I saw racism uh, there, and it unfortunately continues to today. Uh, I did not experience it in Arkansas because I was white. Coming here, I have not experienced it in any way like, uh, again, an African person uh, might or a binational African Japanese uh, children have. Um, some of my children's friends uh, are binational uh, African, um, well, actually African-American and Japanese, to be honest, uh, in that regard, because he's, he's, the, the father is African-American. But um, and there are different um, uh, levels of, of acceptance uh, in, in that regard. Uh, but um, my kids have been very lucky, uh, I think, uh, for, for various reasons. But one, um, although in grade school, there was a teacher who, to be honest, uh, we, we left the school because of that, um, who didn't do anything overt, but he was rather covert in the way he would uh, address uh, the children and treating uh, my daughter especially differently than he taught the other uh, children, and also treating my wife differently uh, in the PTA meetings and things like that. But beyond that one person, and that's a single episode out of thousands of people that my kids have interacted with, yes, there has been uh, teasing and, and bullying, but it was not uh, of an overt, in other words, it wasn't, they were not uh, ostracized because they were binational. Um, they were, uh, they themselves also picked on some of their um, uh, co uh, schoolmates also. So it was just a standard sort of kids teasing each other kind of thing. Um, and they haven't really in interacted or haven't had to um, to face that. And I think that uh, part of that is because that they are, uh, again, white um, and, and Japanese, uh, as opposed to African and Japanese or other uh, ra uh, races in Japanese. Um, the, I guess the one thing that they do get a teasing um, that would be specific to the, the idea of the national is in English class. Um, they're expected to be completely fluent in English. I mean, you know, you're a 12-year-old um, or a 14-year-old child. You don't know English as well as, as a 25-year-old uh, adult, as it were. And so they don't know all the, the words and phrases and things. And so that's something um, that they, and they get a little bit tired of that. Uh, luckily, they do speak the language uh, fairly well, and so they are able to answer. But that would be the one time uh, they get uh, called on for anything in English they get called on for that. Um, and it's not, um, I mean, it is because they're different, but it is not being belittled because they're different. Rather, it's the idea of, of a little bit being celebrated because they're different in some ways. Um, now, having said that, uh, I'm sure they've had cases they've never told me about. Maybe they have had, um, you know, I mean, we have those, but basically, no, we've been very lucky uh, in that regard. Uh, okay. And again, I do think that there is a stratus here that is accepting of uh, a binational Western, I mean, European, American um, binational is different than uh, my national of other situations. Um, okay, okay. okay, I want to ask actually, please. what is your approach to parenting them? Uh, okay, so there's a saying that in unlike in the West, maturity in Asia is defined on how capable you are of listening to your parents instead of how you can make decision, decisions of your own. So with regards to this, uh, your kids are exposed to your your family, at least in the U.S. And I hope that they have been able to, I mean, you visit them once a year. So at least I think they would have a, uh, maybe a somewhat a general idea. How is how is the people like in the States? So at least they would know in a set, they would have adopt a certain style. And of course, being their, being their dad, they would have adopt some of your personality in a sense. Unfortunately, so, yes. But go ahead, sir. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. So, how have your parenting been to them? Is because I think your uh, your in laws are Japanese, so in a sense, they I think they would have want they would have a certain Japanese principle that they would expect to see in your kid. But the thing is, is that they might not show it to completely. Maybe it's due to the different due to the binational household. So, yeah, I want to ask you on this. Sure. 
Well, talking about my in-laws, um, actually, my wife is an only child. Um, and both my in-laws live here in Tokyo, um, just outside of Tokyo, but basically here. And so they are very loving of, uh, very supportive of me and very loving of, of their grandchildren uh, because of the only grandchildren that they have. Um, and we were very lucky when they were young, when they were very small, is a lot of babysitting uh, was helped and done. Um, and that was very, very good for us um, as far as, you know, you, you, know, you get tired. Uh, and I'm on a business trips a lot. So my wife had a lot of time where she needed um, that extra help. And things like that. So there's a very close relationship there. There is a relationship between uh, them and my my American family. Back, luckily, because of technology, you and I are sitting here talking, you know, uh, thousands of miles away. And so the same is true. Um, we use um, uh, Skype and FaceTime and things like that to talk with people uh, back in the states. So it's not the same, uh, but there is a a connection there, and there is a, a bit of an understanding and getting of the personality and things. But in answer to your question about the raising of them and that. Um, I don't know my, my my kids are both teenagers now, so they really don't listen to me at all or my wife either yeah. for that matter. Nothing to do with them being Japanese and, and, and binational or anything. Um, I, I guess, uh, I, don't, I mean, I about when the key thing that I thought that I would do and made sure of was that I would always be speaking English at home um, and to giving them that opportunity to have a, a, some uh, exposure uh, to the language and things like that. And these days, even now, although they've got a, a background in English of sorts, I still basically will speak in English to them. Uh, they'll respond to me in Japanese or sometimes in English, depending. Uh, if they're asking me for a favor, they have to speak it in English. If they're if I'm uh, chastising them, they'll respond back to me in Japanese. But uh, that was something that was a decision that was done. Um, and as far as just having the meals together and things like that to make sure that there is a connection, that there is an opportunity to interact um, beyond um, going out and playing sports with my son or uh, going uh, shopping with my daughter. And uh, what I would consider both good for me and for them. But there's the idea that we we talk to each other as much as we can vis-a-vis um, -vis meals, which now them studying late, me working late is more on the weekends than it used to be when they were in, in uh, grade school and they would come home a little bit earlier. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't have a good answer to your question in the sense that I don't, I don't have a f specific philosophy beyond the idea of making sure that they would have an opportunity, at least for the language, uh, an opportunity then, again, via technology, to interact um, with some people uh, in, in the States uh, and to understand that that is part of their uh, their background. Um, they are bi uh, binational, also by citizens. Um, and so at some point they may decide to choose Japanese or American citizenship, um, but uh, at least to give them the opportunity to make that decision without it kind of being made for them. Um, some of my friends uh, here have children, and uh, they are uh, more more fully um, say enveloped in the, in the culture in the sense that there is not this connection back to the states. Uh, it was all done on purpose, and it was um, uh, I mean, it's not a negative per se, but it is kind of a shame that since their their kids don't really have much of a uh, an understanding of what uh, their American um, uh, side is, as it were. Um, and again, the idea is that everybody is bi, so they have double. They have both the Japanese and the the extra, uh, the the expatriate kind of thing, as opposed to uh, just being uh, part of one and part of the other. They actually have both in that regard. Unfortunately, they didn't. But I'm, I'm trying to keep my kids in that regard to to have both. Sorry, I ramble a little bit there, and that's uh, answer. No worries, no worries. This is your own life, man. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, fair enough. So I used to say. Food stories and tragedies are the ultimate way to bond people of all race and ethnicity. So now comes the fourth one: uh, your kids reaching teenagers. Yes. Apparently, you're not the first parent to tell me. Yeah, they're not listening to me at the moment because they're hitting their teenagers. So, okay, that was an interesting uh, aspect for me since I spent my teenagers abroad. I think my I need to thank my older sister for that since they have to act in the capacity of the parents. But yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> I should remember that, the fourth one. Okay, we learned something new. <laughs> Good deal. All right. Okay. Um, I actually want to ask this uh, pertaining to recent social issues that has happened since the beginning of COVID-19. I think the thing is, is that the issue has already been a prevalent in a sense. However, the COVID in a sense kind of provide a platform for it to start becoming more rampant. And that is on the attacks and continued rising attacks on the Asian American community and 
uh, intersecting it, of course, in the African American community. We saw last year there was several loss of lives that has been really, really tragic. I actually created several posts about this. I I've been called out for just trying to censor it to even so those who might not want to support what my stance are, but I don't care what they want to say because for one thing is that when I was serving the Singapore Armed Forces, uh, we are given a gun. And back then, to me, the gun is a sense of pride as it's a symbol that I'm interested to protect my adopted home. However, now I have the chance to see something like that to be used to take the lives of somebody who can look like me or somebody who look like my loved ones. And it is on the stuff of nightmare. Sure. So, yeah. So my question on this is that why do you feel though that there is such a resistance in accepting the presence of racial in inequality and presenting proper and there's still a resistance in presenting proper racial representation in likes in the likes of media or even in the workplace. Last time I actually was looking at the trailer for Shang Chi, which is the upcoming Marvel movies that will cast Simu Liu, who is a Chinese Canadian, and recently uh, Snake Eyes, Heavy No Me, is going to be apparently retconned to become a Eurasian Asian because Henry Golding is half British and half Malaysian. Okay. There, I can see a lot of comments is actually something that is so resistant in accepting any of these guys, even though it's actually makes sense to do so. So why do you feel though that there is such a cling on to belief that is outdated and yet at the same time is harmful to people in, in this life, even though sure. this is 2021, it's no longer 1960s whereby slavery was legal or anything like that. 1860s, but 1960s, we had lots of Jim Crow laws and we had lots of problems. And I grew up in, in that um, time period, not quite the 60s, but the 70s. Um, but to answer your question, you're right. Um, I think the there is still the fear of the unknown. Um, I mean, we if you have a, a room with no lights on, you know, you're not going to go running in that room. You want to turn the light on and look around and see. Um, and that's a logical process to do. Um, but what you're talking about is illogical. But there is, I mean, illogical in the sense, that not your logic, but the people's opinions that way are illogical. Is that that it's foreign, it's unknown, it's different. Therefore, I'm not going to like it. Uh, I only like the things that I like or that I know and things of that nature. So. Um, because I don't know you, I fear you. And if I fear you, then the, um, was it Yoda that talks about fear leads to hate or, and hate uh, or yeah. something like that? Uh, fear leads to hate, hate leads to anger, anger leads to suffering, suffering leads to the dark side. Something yeah. like that. So, and I mean, I that, that, stop watching too much movies. Touche, touche. Um, but I mean, that, that, that's the case. Unfortunately, I mean, uh, uh, that that is the case is that we have the fear. And so then we have that. Um, and so with that in mind, then I can go on um, American TV. I mean, let's be let's put put right out in front. This, we're talking about America in this case. And I can be on American TV and I can make money. I can have my news show or I can have various things that will play on those fears and will say that we're right and they're wrong. And I will make lots of money and more and more people will start to watch me. Um, and, you know, President Trump obviously lived off that too, and he fed off of that, and he got himself elected uh, because of that. So then you have these people who are in power and these people who are uh, famous, or at least are, are watched and known as saying, uh, if not absolutely racist things, they're very, 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 very close to it. And, and so then you have that kind of stoking up, going up and up and up and up like that. Then people are very much involved and very interested um, uh, in that. And so then we have this, we have the, the, the racial problems uh, that we had. Um, and you're right, they were there long before this happened, and it just simply was a, an escape valve for that. So with that going on, now I'm, I'm a TV producer, and i got to produce a show, and so I want to make sure I can make as much money as I can, and it's got to be as safe as it can be. So instead of me being um, more diverse and working on the diverse, I see this percentage of American society that is not that way, and I can play onto them, not, not in pure racist sense, I'm just simply going to cast a white person in a different uh, person's role uh, and not do it for racial reason, but do it because then I get this person to watch um, the show or I can get a famous person, a famous white person to do the role and then people will watch it. Um, 
what was it? It was Aeon Flux, where they had uh, Johannes Scarlet. Uh, or, uh, oh, Johansson, yeah. Yes. Um, and then uh, other places and things like that that re- happened very recently. So, I mean, this has been that aspect has been going on for an incredibly long time. I mean, if you watch any of old American TV shows, most all of the people who played American Indians were actually Italian. Um, and they were just there because they actually had slightly a, a darker skin than, than uh, other Caucasians and, and things like that. And so this has all been going on. But the idea of why, why it's been, been done is because there is a percentage of the population that are buying or that are spending money that are fearful of things and are uh, at the core racist. I mean, the, the, then there are large people that are less racist, but still um, of that kind of thing. And so I can sell my product to them. They're, that's a ready market. If I want to be diverse, truly, there is a percentage of the world and percentage of America and places that are more interested in diversity, more interested in uh, inclusion um, and things like that. But they... I mean, which is a larger market, and I'm going to go for the, the larger market, or at least I know this market is safer. This market is more challenging. Having said that, um, with social media, with um, the good and bad of Facebook and the good and bad of, of Twitter and things like that, there is more of an opportunity uh, for this to the, the diversity and the idea of diversity to get more um, understood and more discussed and, and ultimately uh, to, to grow. So unfortunately, there is the, the sort of white nationalism that is also growing on Facebook, but there is also the internationalism or the diversity inclusion uh, is growing on there as well. But I think that it all goes down to fear uh, in the sense that uh, I'm, I'm fearful of things I don't know. I've got these people on TV or these politicians that are stoking my fear. And so therefore I am growing in that regard. Um, uh, the, 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 the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, the way I see it is that if we look at the um, opinions, and the uh, response to gay marriage um, or single-sex marriage uh, in the states, especially, and how quickly that changed from, say, 1980 um, into to uh, well, 1990 even for that matter, uh, was still uh, very much a taboo, and, and then to 2010, within 20 years, it completely flipped. Um, and so that, I guess, because it is an internal process, and it's not something that is. Um, I mean, it's between two people, right? It's not between me and it doesn't matter. You can do it kind of thing as opposed to a foreign person that is walking in the street and then somehow or another is coming into my space. Um, but still, I think that is, that's a kind of a, a glide path that perhaps more uh, acceptance can be uh, shown and done um, uh, going forward uh, if, if that's sort of able to flip uh, single-sex marriage as quickly as that has been done. Um, but we'll just see. I mean, you know, it was in 1960 where uh, interracial marriage was illegal until love uh v virginia and i think that was 1960 or so so uh, again even in 50 years time uh interracial marriage uh, has only been legal in america for 50 years so that's something also that's uh not 50 years i'm sorry uh 60 let's see yes 20 60 years i'm an english teacher not a math teacher yeah no worries no worries okay okay but it is fair fair okay okay i think i don't what, what do you think by chance what do you is do you have a different opinion than that uh, I actually share the same kind of mindset, I guess. For one thing is that aside from peer, fear, maybe this is something that was said by a personal idol of mine, Mr. Ty Rawson. Uh, comfort and privilege leads to ignorance. So uh, this is, and people who and people wanting to retain power or wanting to push people away from power creates policies that personally benefit them. Sure. So, yeah, I actually once last year, I created an anti-racism article and within it, I actually compiled every single thing from racism within the Asian community since the main aspiration of it was the xenophobia when COVID first started uh covid first started and a singaporean was attacked singapore being my second home seeing one of its citizens being attacked is something that's personal to me and along with that i also include the racism on the latino community and even the african americans such as including the systemic racism and along with that i when the article is done my proofreader has done everything that was the day where my george floyd passed away so, I mean, I've already included the necessary materials and I feel it's, uh, in a sense, it's a fitting tribute. And I don't really, it's not that when the articles was published, I put, oh, this is in regards to Black Lives Matter. I mean, this is, I just mentioned 
it as a tribute to the late George Floyd. But the thing is, is that I don't want to sensationalize it. It's just something that I created. There are mixed reviews, but I remember one in particular case whereby somebody who apparently is anti-African American because her house was robbed by a black person. And she says I was being crazy or something along the line whereby I was being, I am not being sensitive enough. I scream at her and I call her out because apparently she created content for multicultural, but she's a racist. So I'm like, how does that work? And I called her out for it. I did not embarrass her on social media. I called her out personally. And apparently some one of my then guests actually, uh, at that time, I didn't know who she was. She defended me because she feels that what I've done is something fair. It's it properly represented issues that push the minorities in, well, it's primarily in the US, but we all know that this kind of issue is everywhere. And there's a certain variation of that particular system and policies that are put in place to push people of color away from gaining power in a sense. Yes. yes. So I guess that could be it. And to add on to what Tayo said, it's that firstly, uh, privilege, comfort, uh, equals to ignorance, close a bracket, multiply that by 100 years. So that could be it is because, uh, I mean, well, most, most of us, there is never like what you mentioned earlier, your, your kids have been fortunate enough because they, even though they are bi-nationals, at least they are half white, half Japanese, but it could not, it might not be the same kind of experience if they are African-American or African-Japanese. So that could be something that I feel could be the idea is because people, there's a certain idea of prestige and admiration for certain groups due to how the media has perceived or how the policy has created itself that resulted in at least certain people may be seen a certain way and certain people are seen in a more negative way, I guess. Sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, I actually have two final questions for you. And okay. Yeah, it's actually a spin-off from what you said, just to piggyback a bit on it. Okay. Uh, this one is actually a little bit divert, diverted from the main question itself, but I want to ask what is your career journey like and what should you take note of when working with foreign talents? Because that's what your company is doing and that's what you have been doing for over 20 plus years in Berlin. <laughs> so yeah. go, yeah. No, no. Well, like my career path, uh, basically, again, it was not anything special that I done. It's just rather to be serious. You're lucky. There are lower expectations for foreigners in Japan to be serious because so many, unfortunately, are not. So that is the, the lucky part for me. But the idea of, of how to treat foreign nationals is to remember always that we are, and this is true whether we're on a travel or we're living. I live here, but I'm still a guest here, and. I think it should be done, A, but that's just me. Um, there's the old expression, when in Rome, uh, be as the Romans. Uh, there's even an expression in Japanese, although I, life me right now, I can't remember, but it's basically a direct translation of that. Um, and it is, and so in that sense, remember that always, that you're, even if whatever is going on is you think is just the dumbest thing you've ever heard of, and truly, if we did it this way, it would be so much better. No, um, you're not going to, that's not what's going to happen. Um, you can discuss it, and you can uh, mention and, and suggest and, and do, but understand that um, you talk about the idea of um, uh, culture, I'm sorry, uh, privilege and um, uh, uh, times 100 years. I mean, uh, ignorance ultimately equals even times 100 years. And so the flip side of it is also, too, is that something is done this way for, for a very long time or is thought of this way for a very long time, uh, even if there is a better way to do it, you know, um, uh, there was MySpace, and it seemed like a perfectly fine thing. Of course, fake people come along and, 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 you know, completely better and everything else in that regard. So, but understand that uh, the, the sort of historical process or the sort of uh, the, the MySpace idea, you're not going to change that um, in, you know, you yourself and your discussions and, and your pleadings or whatever is not going to do any of that. You need to understand that you're, you're a guest here and that you're going to follow um, what they're looking at and what they're looking for uh, in, in that regard. Um, it, it going to uh, how to handle foreign talent uh, is, 
is to learn. Uh, basically, again, I mean, even if your opinion you think this is, is a good idea or this is not a good idea, is to figure out why they're doing it this way and why they want to do it this way. Um, and even if it doesn't change your opinion, at least you learn a little bit more uh, of a, a broader perspective of how to do something a, a little bit different, as it were. Um, so the key point is just to be serious. If you take your job seriously uh, as a foreign expatriate, uh, there's a lot of opportunities uh, that can be uh, opened up and and listen um, and and listen to what they're saying, listen to the, the foreign talent and what they're what the reason that they're doing things. Um, now, also too, I was lucky. I came in uh, pre 9/11, uh, and so there was a, a lot of things going on that were much easier, uh, and things are a little bit strict. And it was long before the internet. Um, and so everything was a lot more uh, analog in that regard. So these days, you've got to perhaps not just to be serious, but be serious and also have um, the social skills, the and my social networking skills and things like that uh, to, to get a little bit um, better along. But I don't know if that answers your questions or not, but basically listen um, is the key point there and be serious. I think the phrase, if I'm not wrong, was Nihon ni irutoki wa Nihon jin no yoni, if I'm not mistaken, was it? Okay, um, that's um, that, uh, that, that's fine. Actually, Totomate, oh, it's yeah. here. Um, okay, Totomate. It's a little different than that, but not too too much. I think I've tried it. I've tried. I've tried this translation. Goto ni ito wa goto ni ito shikate. Ito goto ni ito goto ni ito wa goto ni haite ito shikate. So the where be the person where you are. Um, oh. in this regard. So it's a little bit more, it's not specific to Japan. It's just the idea of goto ni ite wa goto ni shikate. They do the style of the place where you are. Okay. So, but you're right too. Nihon ni iru. I know that's when you're in Japan. B is a Japanese. Nihon ni iru, nihon and jin ni deru. So that's true too. Thank but you. I, I did not use Google Translate at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I, I used Google Translate yesterday. <laughs> nah, sorry guys. I don't speak Japanese. I, uh, I speak Japanese. Than me. I speak I speak Mandarin, but uh, that's only from a certain character in the Japanese phrase. So yeah, that's good. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, okay. So the last question for you is this: Do you feel changes are good or bad? And a second part of that is that this is actually a piggyback of your question on something that was depicted in media. Yeah. If you have an opportunity to create a character or even a show to dispel the image that a global citizen's life is the life of an extended holiday, what would you do? So why I related whether it's good or bad is because nowadays uh, people don't really watch their local programming. We have Netflix or some cases we have YouTube or any other devices or any other sites or social sites that we can actually watch programming that is internationally broadcasted or it was created from another country. In fact, uh, why I've had several filmmakers on my show before, several actresses, uh, Elizabeth Liang, who actually was the creator of Alien Citizens, has said it before, is that uh, it took the pandemic for people in the United States to read subtitles because now you realize that there are actually other form of media that is deep that is broad and it might not be from the us but it makes you understand what is life like outside of the united states so i think it's a step in the positive direction however we always know that all these kinds of stuff will always have a commercial value to them in a sense so it, yeah, we for this show, of course, as I said uh, several times when people ask me about it, is to monetize it. Uh, I don't reject if people want to give me money or you want to make me famous. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to argue with that. But the thing is, is that when I first created it, it was not about fame or money. It was just a guy who is trying to curb the stress and depression from dealing with reverse cultural shock. And because therapy is too expensive, so I should use a show instead to as a creative outlet. So yeah, uh, Chris, uh, I'll, pass the back to you. I'll pass the platform back to you. Okay. So if I, I, the the first part of change is change, good or bad, um, 
definitely, I, I feel that change is good. But I must admit, as I get older, I get a little less uh, interested in change. I get a little more stuck in my ways, or I, I, I get to be. I can see uh, myself changing, my my philosophy and everything changing. But in the end, no, change is good. Uh, but change for change's sake is not good. Change for reasons uh, are good. If we have change for just to change something, then sometimes we chase our tail um, and we find ourselves back where we were and we've wasted our time or our energy or our, our treasure or something like that. But if we are looking for a little different and we a little different, a little different and just trying to get a little bit better each time, then that's a good bet. Um, so I think that then that's, of course, that's the reason I'm here. The reason I, I left um, America and came here is to see the world and see some changes. And it's been all the better for me. As far as the expatriate life, you're right. It's not necessarily the life of Riley. Um, there are many good things about it, and there are many um, lovely times. But if I were to create a show, then it would be, I guess, a sitcom where you would have a, um, a husband and a wife, an international uh, marriage, a husband and wife, and then a couple of children. And you would sit around the table, and you would be arguing about dinner, or you would have, I mean, it would be a comedy, so I mean, it's not, not fighting about it, but just, um, or uh the, the kids come home with bad grades or um, the neighbors next door are too noisy and it's hard to sleep or something. Because, in fact, that's what an expatriate life is, is not too much different. Uh, I'm guessing this is from personal experience. No, luckily enough, not the, the noisy. I'm unlucky. Um, our apartments oh, here are pretty, pretty well built. But everything else is absolutely personal experience. Absolutely, 110%. Um, <laughs> and much more so. Um, but, yes, that's the thing. is Basically, that's what an expatriate life is all about. Uh, is um, the, very similar to the life. I mean, you have the same challenges. Problem. The neat thing is you've got the spice of being able to have the, um, and by spice, I mean figuratively, the, the spice of having, uh, well, for me, travel. Japan is very close to Asia, so I can travel around. America is very hard to travel over to foreign countries and things, or to see um, many different people. Tokyo is a huge city. My culture shock wasn't Japan. My culture shock was Tokyo, uh, a city of 30 million people from when I came from a town of about 20,000. Um, this is that's a massive difference and have all the different things. I mean, all the culture and everything else that comes here is really good. So that's neat. But at the end of the day, yes, come home and there's an, uh, you know, um, kids got bad grades or uh, luckily didn't get laid off work. But, you know, husband gets laid off work or wife gets um, loses the, the checkbook at the department store or something else like that. All that happens, basically. So that's right. how I would try and dispel the, the myth of the life of Riley. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, I would love to visit Japan sometime in the future, but Zahi, Zahi. I don't want to stay there. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't stand cold weather. Uh, oh. Yeah, I can't stand cold weather. Uh, a friend of mine says, if you can't stand cold weather, you're worse. Uh, yeah, I openly admit I'm a worse at that part. I don't like cold weather. <laughs> I'm terrified of it. I went to South Korea once, and I was practically trying to find corners every single step to, ball, to, to roll myself into a ball since it's freezing. <laughs> South Korea right. is quite cold too, yes, to be sure. All right. All right, then. Uh, that's actually all the questions I had. Uh, yeah. So, Chris, anything else you want to add on? Uh, no. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you, uh, your patience and listening to my rambling answers. Thank you for that. No, it's lovely. It's lovely. Uh, I really appreciate your insight. All right. Uh, yeah, so this episode will be replayed on my Instagram TV, and it is also available on my YouTube and once the two and i will actually be posting it also on my linkedin after i had something to eat since i'm starving <laughs> and other than that i really appreciate chris for coming to the show for the very for today and because i know you just finished your class so you must be really exhausted man thank you so much for all not a problem let's got some of this as we say in japan anyway all right all right uh, all right, guys. So this is the end of episode 93 of Global Citizens, from wanting to be a globe trotter to finding your own Eldorado. So with that, do take care and stay safe. And hopefully 2021 will be a better year for you. See ya.